السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين صلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا ثم أما بعد Welcome you back to Tawseel class We're going to start in Shalom with book number one which is the book of Imam Ibn Qudam رحمه الله تعالى مختصر من هاج القاصدين We already speak on, on the book of uh, uh, marriage and now inshallah in, in, in the section two speaking about what he calls طيب العشرة طيب العشرة as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran وعاشرهن بالمعروف treat them in kindness and kindly so what's the meaning of, of saying gracious companionship or طيب العشرة between a husband and wife so he has a few points for us inshallah ta'ala we begin with that بإذن الله عز وجل بسم الله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الصلاة والسلام على رسول الله Imam Ibn Qudam rahimahullah Allah he says for one to have a good marriage, the wife should have the following characteristics. Now I want to just bring to your attention one more time that since the, uh, we said that last, last week, um, since the, the man is the one who proposes to the marriage, the man who is the one who pursues that marriage, and the lady she's in the receiving end. So that's why when the recommendation comes, usually the recommendation comes for the man who's come to his choices. Now that doesn't mean that the woman should actually ignore her uh, preference and characteristic, which he's going to speak about towards the end, inshallah ta'ala. But that's why he addresses the, the subject from man's perspective over here. So he says, look, for a marriage to be successful, for that companionship to be successful, a husband or a man should be looking for these qualities in a wife. And what are these qualities right now? The first and most important trait is religiousness, deen, for the Prophet wasallam said, choose the one who is religious. An irreligious wife will ruin her spouse's religiousness and trouble his heart with jealous feelings so that his life will be in turmoil. So Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salam wa Now when it comes to the subject of deen, it's very obvious from hadith al-Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when he says, قَالْ تُنْكَحُ الْمَرْأَةُ لِأَرْبَعَ A lady is sought for marriage for one of the four qualities. She says, قَالَ He says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, four qualities. Do you guys know these four qualities? What are they? Can you tell me what these qualities are? Number one, the, for her beauty. Number two, for her, for her uh, mal, means for her wealth. Number three, the lineage, means her, 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 line, her family line, bloodline, mashallah. And number four, subject of deen. So when the Prophet ﷺ gave the recommendation, he says what? Fad for dini taribat You seek the one who is religious, may you be blessed. Now what's the meaning of saying religious to me? Because he did not explain that in much details. Obviously, this is not the place for it. But when it comes to the subject of being jealous, he said, the one who is not jealous is going to cause problem. How so? After dina zawjiha, because he's now, if she's not religious, no matter how much he tries to be religious or establish religious lifestyle in the household, it's not going to work. She's, not, she's going to defy that. She's not going to be a, a recipient of this. And so it's going to cause a lot of problem and damage in the relationship in the household. So that would affect his iman and his practice of the deen. The second thing he says, Qal, azrat bihi, it could also cause him harm in terms of humiliation, reputation. If she doesn't care about her boundaries with, with the opposite gender or her akhlaq and manners and how she speaks with the people and all that stuff and so on. She doesn't fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that could cause also that type of damage. In addition to that, he goes, قَدْ سَلَكَتْ سَبِيلَ الْغَيْرَ so, uh, لَمْ يَزَلْ فِي بَلَى If now the subject of jealousy becomes a problem, how so? One of two things. Whether it's because he becomes jealous. If she's not religious and she doesn't maintain those boundaries, He's going to always be now suspicious, always jealous about her, her movements, her akhlaq, and her many practices. Or it could be the other way around. She, because she doesn't know her religious boundaries, what is right and what is wrong, what is halal, what is haram, she can also be, be actually so jealous that would also ruin the relationship as well. So either way, someone without the, the proper tadayun and deen, they might actually cause so much damage into the relationship. Now, when it comes to deen, I have to bring to our attention one thing that is very important. There's a difference between being religious and being spiritual. Being religious and being spiritual. So many, many people, you find them to be religious, mashallah. And what does that mean? Being religious here means that they actually, they do, they do practice the outwardly aspect of the deen. So they pray, they fast, they mashallah sometimes in the first line in the masjid at all times probably. But that doesn't mean they become spiritual, which means that tadayun, does not reflect in their akhlaq and their manners. And you have some other people who might be very, very spiritual. What does that mean? It would come to their, to their character and akhlaq, they're masha, they're amazing. But unfortunately, they have no deen, meaning they don't really relate that to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They have no interest in maybe um, uh, doing this to seek the pleasure of the Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala. So either way, it is absolutely wrong. You need to be religious, 
and seek with that spirituality. Religiosity is your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the creator. And spirituality is your relationship with the people, akhlaq and the manners. Being religious is when you do your duty to Allah azza wa jal, and being spiritual, your akhlaq and your manners go beyond the practice. Now that's actually what you owe the people around you in your life. So he, rahimahullah ta'ala, he said that when it comes to the deen, he just mentioned it, you know, kind of like generally, generally speaking. Also, when it comes to being practical about seeing tadayun, let's be real th these days. I mean, today, when it comes to even being religious, what does it mean even? It's a spectrum, right? Those are, mashallah, ultra-conservative, and you have somebody who is, mashallah, barely, you know, alhamdulillah, maintaining the overall of tadayun. There's a huge perspective, and huge actually spectrum right now when it comes to tadayun. So for people to get married to somebody, you need to seek someone who's religious. The question is, how religious are you talking about? How many of you, how many of you, raise your hand if you would will, you'd be willing to marry somebody who is less religious than you are? How low are we talking about? 50%, 60%, there's a, there's a percentage for that. You could say, no, no, this is too much for me, right? But you, the vast majority would say, no, I'm not gonna marry someone who's less religious than I am. Okay, but now, how many of you would say, I would like to marry somebody who's more religious than I am? More religious. The vast majority, right? But how high are you talking about? How far above or ahead of you this person is going to be? Some of us might say, well, as, as far as possible, because I want them to do what? To pull me up with them, right? But where is the dilemma over here? The dilemma is that if you are here at this level of religiosity, and you are looking for someone who's above you, right? And we already agree that it's, actually, it's rarely that anyone would look where? To someone who's below them. So if you're looking up here, this person, where is, he, is she or he's gonna be looking for? Higher. So how do you want them to settle to marry you then? So that's why a lot of people, unfortunately, in the pursuit of a religious person, they were never satisfied because they're pursuing a mirage, something you can really accomplish easily. So if you would like to marry somebody at this level, what is it that you need to do yourself? What do you need to do? Get yourself up there. Get yourself up there so that you can attract somebody of the same level. But if you're unable to get there, then what is the most reasonable thing for you? To marry somebody where? Around the same level. So when it comes to religiosity, yes, of course, like I said, it's a spectrum today. But you need to have somebody who can, you can grow with, inshallah, wa ta'ala. Obviously, if you find somebody who's better than you, mashallah, and tadayun, that's amazing. But it also comes with liability. What is that liability? You feel always underachieving. Uh, they never feel satisfied with your performance. So no matter how much you try, it's, they're still ahead of you and getting even you know, farther away while you're still on the baby steps to get up to that level. So always remind, remind yourself that if you would like to marry somebody at that certain level, you upgrade yourself there. So you can attract someone like this. Otherwise, find someone who has the exact same interest in growing in their deen, and you grow together, inshallah ta'ala. Now. The second is good characters. Husn al-khuluq. An ill-mannered woman brings more harm than benefit. So we already mentioned that earlier. Um, when it comes to the subject of husn al-khuluq, good manners. And this is now their relationship with whom? With the creation. So the first category is their relationship with the creator, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The second category is their relationship with the creation, the people, husn al-khuluq. Why is husn al-khuluq so important? And, and it's very obviously. And I believe personally, and I keep telling young people today, as many as they're looking, mashallah, to all these amazing qualities in a spouse. She's looking for someone who's handsome, someone who's, mashallah, well accomplished, someone who's smart, someone who's religious, someone who's this, someone who's that. But then if they don't have the good man and the good akhlaq, it becomes extremely dangerous. What keeps husband and wife together really is that kind of akhlaq and manners. Husnul khuluq is what people today call it in relation to what they call it today. Let me rephrase the question. What brings people together in marriage? What do you guys think? What is that quality that we look for that will bring us together in marriage? Compatibility, right? And what compatibility means? You share values, you share your characteristics, this and that and so. So that's what brings you easy to marry somebody because you share the same thing. But in, in reality, that does not necessarily guarantee sustainability. So what guarantees continuity and sustainability of that relationship then? If compatibility doesn't, what would make them stay together then? Flexibility. 
And what is it that you need to do to be flexible, to have husn al-khuluq? If you have good manners, you become flexible. You're always forgiving, or willing to forgive at least. You're compromising. Your values are now different than others. So you see things in a different perspective. So husn al-khuluq is the true meaning of flexibility. And that's what really makes people stay together in a relationship. Because you're not rigid, you're not so harsh, you don't have a, a bad manners when it comes to opposing with people, or to dealing with foes or friends, whatever that is. There's always a specific level and a specific standard. So husn al-khuluq is extremely important. Now that's for the relationship. Obviously, the Prophet Sallallahu he promotes husn al-khuluq in general for us. When he said, Salawat Allah wa salam alayhi, Laysa shayun athqalu fi mizani fi mizan abdi yawm al-qiyamati min husn al-khuluq. There is nothing more rewarding or heavier in the scale of the servant of Allah on the Day of Judgment than what? They're good manners. Nothing heavier than that. And the Prophet Sallallahu says, Aqrabukum minni majlisan yawm al-qiyamah ahsanikum akhlaqa. The closest to me on the Day of Judgment in terms of their place in Jannah, will be those who are well, the best-mannered people. So even if you are unable to pray that the the way the Prophet did, or fast the way the Prophet Sallallahu did, but with their good akhlaq and manners with the people, you can compete with those who are doing all these amazing good deeds and bring you closer to the Prophet Sallallahu And if that is the case, why would you want to miss this opportunity, especially with those who are closest to you, your spouse and your children? So husn al-khulaq is extremely important to keep the relationship, you know, really uh, meaningful, number one, and also uh, uh, bearable. Because you might be going through financial difficulties, you might be going through um, uh, uh, you know, political, God knows what happens, and many other difficulties. But subhanAllah, husn al khuluq and good manners, good akhlaq can help keep people together and glue them together. May Allah give us husn al khuluq, ya Rabbil Alameen. Naam. The third is beauty, husn al khuluq. Mm. This is also desirable as it is a means to chastity. This is why a man is commanded to look at the prospective wife. It is true that some men before did not care about beauty and were not after pleasure. It has been narrated, for example, that Imam Ahmad chose a one-eyed woman instead of her sister. This, however, is rare as the nature of most men does not agree with this. Now, in regards to him saying uh, he chose a, a, a one-eyed woman uh, over her sister, the word sister, he doesn't necessarily mean her blood sister. It means actually another one, like somebody else. Now, what does he mean by this? He's called husn al-khalq. Husn al-khalq, which again means the, 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 the physical now characteristics. So husn al-khuluq, that's their, uh, emo, their moral characteristics. Husn al-khalq, their physical characteristic right now. That's the physical beauty. There is no doubt, when it comes to the subject of beauty, it's, uh, uh, um, everybody is after something beautiful, whether it's actually uh, a spouse or even uh, something you want to do or you accomplish. But why is it that people focus always on a beautiful image when it comes to selecting a spouse? What is the perception that we have in our mind? What's the association that comes with beauty in our mind? Imam Ibn, Ibn Hajar, Ibn, uh, Ibn Hazm, rahimahullah, he highlighted that beautifully in his book, Tawq al-Hamama, The Ring of the Dove. And he said that, why do people always fixated on the beautiful image? The lady, she wants to have a cute, handsome guy. And the guy, he wants to have, mashallah, uh, you know, a super, yani, beautiful woman. But why beauty is so important to us? What is the association over here? Anyone knows? You studied that with us, yeah? Mm. So if they're physically beautiful, they must be you know, beautiful from the inside. Reality defies that, by the way. You have a lot of beautiful people who are just bad manners, unfortunately. But what is the perception we have when it comes to beauty? Yes. Perfection, beautiful. Look, even I answered, said by beautiful answer, right? I use the word beautiful for the perfect answer. Why? Because we always associate perfection with beauty. As he said, Rahimahullah Ta'ala, he quoted the ayah in the Quran. Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala says, We have created man in the most perfect image, the most beautiful image. So as human beings, we associate perfection always with beauty. So if something is beautiful, it must be what? Perfect. If he's handsome, then he must be what? Perfect. If she's beautiful, she must be Perfect. So we have this kind of association between perfection and beauty. That's why people, they look for that. Now, when it comes now to define, to define what is beautiful, that's where the ulama and people, they argue. So what is considered beautiful anyway? Is there any one standard for beauty? Supposedly, no. Because every culture has their own standard of beauty. 
Unfortunately, in the globalization era and the age of the internet and so on, and there is a push, there is so much push on one particular standard of beauty that is dominating now the market of what is considered beautiful, and that is the European standard of beauty. In terms of color skin has to be a specific tone, in terms of the, the size of your nose, the size of your body, the size of your, your height, your this, your that, all these things unfortunately being pushed you know, on us human beings to believe that this is the only way you can conceive and perceive beauty, which unfortunately it's a huge, a huge market obviously, a huge industry that people, they benefit from that unfortunately. But in reality when it comes to beauty, Imam Ibn Hazm rahimahullah, he also continues, he says, قال, as for beauty, قال, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Which means, what you might consider to be beautiful for others, just, are you kidding me? What, you, what is that? And that's why sometimes you see people who are married, Masha, you look at them and you say, SubhanAllah, how did this happen? How did this miracle happen, right? But it did happen by the grace of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So beauty is in the eye of the beholder. And he explained on that, that some people, they see some traits to be uh, um, you know, not so beautiful qualities, and others, they think of these qualities to be actually amazing qualities. Like, for example, the size of the body, for instance. People, they have different perception of what is actually so beautiful or what. Or the height of the person, for example. Or all that kind of stuff, you know, being muscular or otherwise. All these things. People have different sound when it comes to beauty. So, but overall, he says, why is that so important? It's important because it is desirable because, alhamdulillah, it's a means of chastity. So when I look at my spouse, I'm pleased. I'm pleased with what I see. And alhamdulillah, that makes it easier for me not to look for anything else. That's the meaning of that. He said, that, so therefore, men are actually, uh, they've been asked to look for that. Well, even the Prophet Sallallahu he said to Jabir radiallahu an, he says, did you see her when he came to him? He said that he uh, proposed to a lady. The Prophet suggested for him, Qal, uh, did you see her? He says, no, Ya Rasulullah, I didn't. Like, I took the word for the people who proposed her to me. He goes, no, you better go and see her. That is, makes it a bigger chance for this to last longer. So therefore, it's important that you see so you can feel pleased. So what is beauty over here is really when you look at the person, you feel comfortable with them. That's what matters. But to have a, a, a specific standard that unfortunately because of the bombardment of images and pictures and videos that people they see, that is, makes things difficult and harder for people today to actually to, uh, uh, to find someone like that. So remember to keep it inshallah ta'ala moderate when we teach people about these matters inshallah. He said, some people, they didn't even care about that. Like when it comes to seeking marriage, for them, what is the main, main uh, characteristic they're looking for? Their deal. How she looks, how he looks, not a big deal for me. Why? I don't care about the looks, I care about their deal. And their, because I know there is an inner beauty. Beyond the physical beauty, there is inner beauty. That's what I'm pursuing. That is what I'm looking for. He said, these are people are very rare, obviously. Very rare. And he mentioned an example of Imam Ahmad bin Hanbal, rahimahullah ta'ala. I could not really authenticate that. But he says that he would prefer, would say, did he marry her? Or just maybe he said, if I had an option, I would choose one, uh, one eye over another one because of her akhlaq and her manners. Obviously, that's different. Because sometimes people, they marry for different reasons, like we said in the previous session, <laughs> is that you marry not necessarily because of the beauty or because you're feeling, feeling committing a, a haram. Simply, you want to do it because it becomes more like an act of kindness. I marry somebody who's more likely won't be, won't be uh, successful in finding a spouse, for example. So alhamdulillah, I would like to marry this person. Why? Because I want to get the reward of helping her, helping him, you know, uh, secure themselves, and inshallah having family together, based on the taqwa of the of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yeah, he says, but it's very rare among the people to pursue that. Now, The fourth is a moderate dowry, kiffat al-mahr. Saeed ibn al-Musayyib married off his daughter for two dirhams. Now, when it comes to khifat al-mahr, khifat al-mahr or the, the mahr dowry what does it mean by that? There is actually an indication to what, Ijma'ah? When you say khifat al-mahr, the, ma the dowry needs to be simple, simple dowry. That indicates what to you? Easy mahr, but what does it mean when it comes to proposing to a family and they say, alhamdulillah, you know, whatever you can afford, we're good with that. What does that tell you? Not too demanding, alhamdulillah rabbi amin. Easy to get married. They're very dignified people, mashallah. They really value your qualities more than your money. There is so much thing that you get. Also their simplicity and humbleness and humility. And in addition to that, if they come from a humble background, from a humble background, it's easy to please. Easy to please, what does that mean? 
You buy chocolate, mashallah. You buy flowers, tabarakallah. But if they come, mashallah, from a wealthy family and household, you buy them a car, what do they say? This is it? Right? Like this is, what kind of car is this, right? But that's why it gets really hard, which is why some of the ulama would come to the financial, the financial aspect of, of seeking marriage. They say, look for someone around the same level as well too. Because if you marry somebody who's way above you in terms of financial uh, prosperity and success, it's hard to please them. No matter what you buy, their family could buy them actually more than what you can afford. Let's say for Eid, for example. You are able to afford to give your wife $200 as a uh, ADA, for example. Her brother comes to give her 1,000. Her father comes at 5,000. Now, what happened to you? <laughs> that, that doesn't become that satisfactory factor in the relationship over here. So that's why he says, look for somebody who's easy, not very demanding, that make life, alhamdulillah, simple and grow with you in that matter, inshallah ta'ala. Now, and by the way, is there any limit for dowry though? Is there any limit on what is considered high or low? In Islamically speaking, there is no limitation. How do you exactly, how do you define what is considered reasonable? Bil-urf. Al-urf, which means what is customary among the people. How do I know what is customary? Well, you look around, ask around in her family, in her household, in her tribe, in her community, the girl of her status, how much they receive, for example, for mahar. In this case, you evaluate all these factors and you say, okay, so it's 5,000, 7,000, 10,000, 2,000, or whatever. Or they might tell you, you know what? I don't need any money. Just a promise to take me for hajj or umrah. Alhamdulillah. That would be also another form of mahar. Naam. Umar radiallahu ta'ala said, do not exaggerate the dowries of women. And just as it is disliked for a woman to ask for a big dowry, it is equally disliked for a man to ask for how much fortune she has. Naam. Qal al-Thawri. As Sufyan al-Thawri said, when a man gets married and asks, what does the woman own? Know that he is a thief. <laughs> so, how many thieves you met in your life lately, Ajima? <laughs> Almost not. Okay, before we get to this point, actually, I forget to talk about um, the, the story of, of uh, Saeed ibn Musayyib, rahimahullah ta'ala. So, Saeed ibn Musayyib, who married off his daughter for two dirhams, it's a very famous story in which Saeed ibn Musayyib, and just to give you perspective or, or a background of the story itself. So Saeed ibn Musayyib was one of the tabi'een, a very well known of the tabi'een who met the Sahaba radiallahu ta'ala and mardan. And uh, um, during his time, who was ruling politically in Medina, in Mecca, around Muslim country? Who, who was ruling, ruling in the Muslim land at that time? Anyone knows? The Umayyads. And the Umayyads, they, they changed the Khilafah system into a monarch system, which created a lot of rift between the Muslim in that time. So in order for them to seek a legitimacy of their rule, they always wanted to ally themselves with the scholars, because the scholars of that time used to be the true leaders of the Ummah. The ulama used to be the true leaders of the Ummah. If a mufti says something, everybody follows that. So the political leadership always wanted to ally themselves with the, the religious leadership. So part of what they did is they tried to marry from their, from their children. So if, a, if an emir has a daughter, will he give her off to a, a scholar, for example, or, or, his, or, his, or his son? And if they know that they're, the, some of the scholars have daughters, they would probably maybe marry them off to their children. So one of those incidents is, was al, uh, Marwan ibn al-Hakam, or Abdul, Abdul Malik ibn Marwan. Abdul Malik ibn Marwan, he was the, the Khalifa of that time. Saeed al Musayyib was well known to be the great scholar of Medina. One of the great scholars of Medina. So he wanted to take advantage of that and has his son marrying his daughter. Al-Walid ibn, Al ibn Al Malik, he actually he wants his, his son, Al-Walid actually, the son of Abdul Malik. Uh, he, so he wanted his son, Al-Walid, to marry her. And Saeed didn't want to do that. He didn't want to get involved with politics. He didn't want to be part of any of these kind of you know, uh, games with the politicians. So he wanted to avoid this. So, but the Khalifa keeps insisting, sending proposal after proposal. Then one day, Abdullah, Abd, Saeed al Musayyib, he noticed one of his, one of his uh, uh, um, uh, avid students was missing for a few days. When he showed up, when he came back, he, uh, his name was, uh, uh, he's, known, he's known as Ibn Abi Wada'a, or Kuthayr Ibn al Muttalib Ibn Abi Wada'a. He's known, uh, he's known for being Ibn Abi Wada'a. So Ibn Abi Wada'a showed up, and Saeed al Musayyib, he said, Where have you been? He says, I'm so sorry, uh, uh, Sheikh, you know, my, my wife just recently passed away and I was just taking care of things, you know, after her passing to take care of things and household and so on. 
So he, he gave him a condolence. He goes, okay, did you get married? So soon, yeah, three days right after she was buried. He goes, no, it's not on my mind anymore yet. He goes, well, I have a wife for you. And it's like, like really? He says, yeah. Would you marry my daughter? And he's just like, the daughter of Sayyidina Musayyib. Of course he's not going to say. He's not going to say, well, my wife just passed. No, 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 of course I will take your daughter. So he called the people and they made the nikah and he married her. Then he says, I went home so happy, so excited. I was fasting. I didn't have much for food and, and oil, olive, olive oil and some salt. So I was preparing for my iftar. And then suddenly he says, I hear knocking on the door. I said, who is it? He goes, Saeed. He said, I, every Saeed I knew crossed my mind except for Saeed al-Musayyib. Because he has never been seen away from the masjid to his house, masjid to the house for 40 years. So he says, I just went to go and open the door and I see Saeed al-Musayyib standing right in front of me. So he said, Qawaqa fi qalbi. It hit me that maybe he changed his mind. <laughs> maybe he rushed it. <laughs> or his daughter said no. So therefore, he's just going to come to see if it's going you know, to end it. He goes, uh, uh, what's going on, uh, Sheikh? He says, well, I know that you get married, and I, I hate to leave you like this without your spouse, so I brought her to you. So he brought his, his daughter actually from behind and says, here's your wife. He got her in there, closed the door, and Saeed left. He said, I had no idea what to do. He didn't even see her yet because she's covered. Because when the door was closed, that girl was so shy that she fainted. She passed out. He freaked out. So he went up the, the house, up over the, to the rooftop, and he started calling his neighbors, throwing at them some rocks. Help, help, help. So the ladies, they gathered. His mom also heard about the news. She also came in. And then they took care of the lady, and his mom told him, don't even come near her for three days. Don't touch her. I'm going to take care of her first for you. Make sure that she's OK, inshallah ta'ala. And then he said, subhanAllah, after, of course, they, uh, they consummated the marriage, they lived a, a, beautiful, a beautiful life. There was the day that it said, she was, alhamdulillah, he said, mashallah, she's beautiful manners, great knowledge, uh, Quran, this and that and so on. So he goes, there was, there was the day she was rush, he was rushing to leave early, uh, right after the few days after consummating the marriage. She goes, where do you think you're going? He goes to attend the Sheikh Saeed al-Musayyib's uh, halaqa. She goes, Idris. <laughs> Sit down, I'll give you the knowledge of Sayyid al Musayyab. Like, I have it, don't worry about it, I'll give it to you. All right? So, um, subhanAllah, I mean, those are some of those very unique examples. So, the, the idea is that he, he had two dirhams as mahar that was able to afford, and he said, I even borrowed some from some friends just to give that mahar to Sayyid al Musayyab, radiallahu ta'anhu, warda. Umar bin Khattab, radiallahu anhu, he warned people against exaggerating into al Mughala, which means you know, spiking the prices of muhur, <coughs> making it so high that it com becomes completely unaffordable to people, unfortunately. Again, there is no limitation to what is considered high, what is considered low, and come to the mahar. It is just completely open to the culture to um, regulate that. The Prophet ﷺ, though, he said, baraka, the less the mahar, the more the blessing and the baraka therein. Then he said, he uh, just like it is dislike for, um, for the ladies to to raise their muhur and their dowry, it is also dislike for the man even to inquire about how much money you have. Now, obviously, if it's just for reserving her hukuk, to document her hukuk, that's one thing. But if it's a, uh, if it's a matter of just knowing uh, how much I'm, uh, I'm going to uh, get myself into, that's definitely what he said, that then you're a thief, basically. You're not after the marriage, you're after her money and after her wealth. So, what about today? Does the prenuptial agreement fall into this now, being any thieves now uh, bargaining among themselves? No, astaghfirullah, it doesn't fall that way. It's part of shurut al-nikah, that you come to an agreement in regards to specific, let's say, any finances uh, between them. As long as it's a mutual agreement, it should be okay, inshallah, to baraka wa ta'ala. Naam. The fifth is virginity, bakkara. The lawgiver has encouraged men to marry virgins. A virgin is generally more inclined and affectionate towards the man than a non-virgin, mm. Fayyib, which in turn creates love, what? Indeed, human beings by their very nature feel affection towards their first loves. This also makes the man love her more, as men prefer that no one else has touched their women before them. What about now for women? Do they have to marry somebody who's also a, a, a virgin, never married before? It's the same, the same preference. It is the same preference. Why is he suggesting that for? Now, remember, this is not necessarily like a standard, yani, if it's not there, the stuff for Allah, the marriage is going to be nullified. No, it's a recommendation. 
Why is that? For the reason that he mentioned over here. Because when you marry somebody for the first time, never been married before, that first attachment becomes, alhamdulillah, the standard, the point of reference. So they always have that love always you know, attached with them. Even in the Arabic, uh, we say, actually, they say, فَالْحُبُّ لِلْحَبِيبِ الْأَوَّلِينَ Like uh, the true love is always for the first love, right? Now, uh, sometimes that love was never consummated, so just may becomes memory. But once it becomes actually consummated and the true relationship becomes a loving relationship, that becomes a, the point of reference for all forms of, uh, uh, of beauty in the relationship here. However, it doesn't mean you cannot marry a thayyib, someone who was married from before. Where we get that, that rule from? It is actually from the story of, of Jabir. One time the Prophet Sallallahu he came back from a, a journey, Jabir was with him, and he was a young man, so he was rushing ahead of the Prophet Sallallahu as they start seeing the boundaries of Medina. And the Prophet joked with Jabir, Ya Jabir, what, what's the rush for? And he said, Ya Rasulullah, I'm sorry, but I got married before I left with you, I didn't get a chance to spend time with my wife, I want to go and catch up with her, inshallah ta'ala. So the Prophet was joking, he goes, Qal bikran am thayyib, did you marry Bikr, someone who's never married before, or thayyib? He says, no, Ya Rasulullah, I married a thayyib, someone who was married before. فَقَالَ هَلَّا بِكْرًا تُلَعِبُ وَتُلَعِبُ Why don't you marry someone like yourself? A young person, your age, at least, you know, someone like you who has never been married before. قَالَ He gave his reason. He called, Ya Rasulullah, when my father passed, he left me seven sisters. He was the only boy among seven sisters. He said, I didn't want to bring an eighth one to care for, that, for her as well, too. I want someone to help me care for my sisters. So the Prophet has made dua for him. So again, it's not necessarily a make it or break it deal, but it's definitely, it's something that's preferable. Wallahu alam. The sixth is fertility, wulud. And what does that even, how do you even know that? Are you going to ask them or take a fertility test or what's the situation? Here? No, usually it goes by observing, observing the family around. Like, are they, mashallah, fertile families? Do they have a large number of kids? And are they healthy, unhealthy? Do they have uh, triplets? You know, uh, do they have uh, 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 twins or this and that? These are indicators can tell you if they're fertile or otherwise. Now. The seventh is lineage, nasb. This means that a woman should be from a pious Muslim family. Now, um, how would you know that anyway? Because even if the family is martial of the most righteous, does it guarantee that the spouse you're going to choose is going to be that person? Similar, you see the family martial is amazing, and the guy who comes to propose to you, there is no indication to say that he's not that great or that actually righteous person. But then when you get married, what happens? The akhlaq comes out. Their bad manners starts coming out. So is that the fault of the family? No, that's not their fault. So how do we know that this person is actually uh, from uh, you know, good akhlaq or not? Just the family itself is no longer an indicator for the goodness of the individual, it's at least in our time. Just the family is you know, kind of being good. Similarly, just because the family is not that great, it doesn't mean that boy or that girl are not religious or actually with good man's good akhlaq. So sometimes we're going to have to overlook that based on the circumstances on the individual as well too. However, Having a good family, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, at least is an indicator that these, the, the man or woman in this situation was exposed to, alhamdulillah, to that good terbiyah, good akhlaq, good opportunity. So hopefully they have learned enough to carry along with them when they come to the marriage. Now. The eighth is absence of close kinship, ajnabiyya. Now. Uh, and what does that mean? He says, basically, like, there's a narration, it's, a, it's, a, it's considered actually daif jiddan, some they say it's even fabricated, is that gharribun nikah, which means go far away in your nikah, meaning don't marry someone who's close to you, which is different from what the Prophet ﷺ did. The Prophet ﷺ, he married cousin. Who was his cousin that he married, ﷺ? Zainab, radiallahu He married from the tribe. He married from outside the tribe as well too. He married someone close, someone not so close. So the Prophet of marriages were actually very diverse to give us examples, what we can choose for for ourselves. But here he says, if you can have somebody away from the kinship, that's probably maybe better for you. I mean, in the, in the past, probably they had that because uh, the tribal system was strong and powerful and they would like here to strengthen maybe the society through cross-tribal marriages and these things and so on. In our time, if really marrying a close relative first cousin or second cousin, is good for you, then why not? I know we inherited bias against marrying a cousin, but 
why not? Maybe for the best circumstances, the compatibility is the, the easiest because you're from the same family, you know, the, you know each other, you know, you grow up with, with the same, you know, family members and so on. It makes it easy for people to marry someone who's close to them. So there is no really indication to anything. Some they say it's because actually uh, uh, being afraid of uh, hereditary diseases, for, for instance, but there's really no guarantee. Even if you marry someone who's not even close to you, there is no guarantee that nothing's going to come up as a, as a health condition as a result of that. May Allah keep you all safe, Ya Rabbil Alameen. Naam. This being said, just as a man should take a look at a woman, the woman's guardian should find out about the man's religiousness, character, and situation. Like what we said earlier, those same qualities also apply to the woman when she looks for her husband. Naam. This is because the woman becomes tied to her spouse like a slave does. So if no. the guardian marries her off to a sinner or, a, or an innovator, he has violated both her and himself. Just like the Prophet says in the Khutbah al-Wada'a, he says, قال, and he, he's, bin he told men, make sure to take good care of your wives. They're like captives in your household. Take care, good care of them. No. A man once asked Al-Hasan, to whom should I marry my daughter? Who's Al-Hasan over when they say Al-Hasan? Al-Basri. Al-Basri, usually. Al-Hasan Al-Basri, known for this beautiful statement. Naam. So he replied, someone who fears Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if he loves her, he will honor her. And if he hates her, he will not wrong her. What a beautiful statement, Jama'ah. Allah, what a beautiful statement. Who should I choose for my wife? Who, um, for my daughter, for example. You're right? Someone that you know, he will fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, be mindful of Allah and the way he treats her. If she was good, he will honor her and be generous with her. If she was not that great, he will still not be oppressive or bad towards her. That's the bare minimum for what you need to look for in a person. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala provide our families with the best, Ya Rabbil Alameen, in the dunya and the akhirah. Wallahu ta'ala, inshallah. We'll stop here and we'll continue next week, inshallah ta'ala. For this one, inshallah, we're going to be starting on page, uh, um, what page is this? Page 368, 368, inshallah ta'ala. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, baraka anabiya na Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam, tasliman kathira, thumma amma ba'd. Just a reminder for what we're studying here, hadith number 23. Hadith Abi Malik al-Ash'ari, radiyallahu ta'ala wa rda, anna Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, qal, al-tahuru shatru al-iman, wa al-tahuru shatru al-iman. Wa alhamdulillah, tamla al-mizan, wa subhanallah, wa alhamdulillah, tamla ani, aw tamla ma bayna al-samawati wa al-ard, wa al-salatu nur, wa al-sadaqatu burhan, wa al-sabru diya, wa al-Quran hujjatu laka wa alayk. Qal, kullu nasi yagdu. In the narration here, Abu Malik al-Ash'ari al 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 he said, the Messenger of Allah Sassam says, At-tuhuru shatru al-iman, which means purity if have a faith. Walhamdulillah, saying alhamdulillah, fills the scale. And he says in another narration, subhanallah, walhamdulillah, both are filling the scales together. And they fill my bayna samawatu up between the heavens and the earth. Was salatu nur, salah is considered light, As-Sadaqatu Burhan is a proof. Was-Sabru Diya is also illumination. Wal-Qur'an Hujjatu Laka Wa Alayk. Qur'an can be a proof for you or against you. Kullu nasi yagdu. Everybody goes out in the morning to mind their business and their life. Fabai'u nafsa fa mu'atuqa aw mubiquha. So some of them, they set themselves free, means from Jahannam, or they destroy themselves. May Allah protect us from this India Rabbil Alameen. And if you guys remember, when we talked about the meaning of At-Tuhuru Shatru Al-Iman, that uh, tahara, purity, is half of faith. Do you guys remember the conclusion? What was the conclusion that Imam Ibn Rajab Rahimahullah suggested? That was on page uh, 367, when he said that, look, at the end we understand that when it comes to shatr, meaning half means what? One of two things. You have a category of two. One of them, regardless of how big or small in terms of proportion to the other one, it is considered half in that sense, that ha one of two. And he brought the example here of Hadith Uqba, in which the Prophet ﷺ mentioned that at-tuhur wudu 
proper wudu and saying la ilaha illallah will open the doors of Jannah for you. So if you have now wudu which represents purification and purity and saying la ilaha illallah which is the subject of faith, so now tuhur becomes fa uh, half or shatter based on that perception. That was the op opinion of Mab ibn, ibn Qudamar ibn uh, Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala. However, he adds something else, which is the one that we need to start with, inshallah ta'ala, towards the end on page 368, where he says, it is also possible interpretation. Naam. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillahi wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Qala al-mu'allif rahimahullah. It is also a possible interpretation to say that all the features of Iman, both deed and deeds and words, purify the heart and make it grow. As for the purification with water, it is particularly with respect to purification of the body and its cleanliness. Thus, there are two categories of the attributes of Iman, one of which is the purification of the outward and the other the purification of the inward. So that there are the two halves of this understanding. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best what he means and what his messenger meant by all of this. So what was now Ibn, Ibn, Ibn Rajab rahimahullah ta'ala referring to this right now? A whole different category. He goes, look, when it comes to tahara, there are two types of purif purity. There's a physical and also the spiritual one. So as for the physical, that's what probably the hadith was referring to, the physical tahara. And the other one is now the, sp the spiritual tahara. So therefore, they're considered half from that perspective. This is one of the most common interpretation when it comes to this hadith. That's the most common interpretation of this hadith. So you can actually remember these two examples. The first one in which he said that, look, it's half of two. So we have wudu versus la ilaha illallah, they make it half. And also we have here the meaning of physical versus, of course, the emotion, the, the moral pure, uh, and spiritual purity as well too. Then he concluded by saying, he, and, and then Allah knows the best, which means, look, these all the opinions that are out there. It seems to be what he referred to first, but then came to this one and says, and Allah knows best. Like, although this is a, a plausible uh, interpretation, but Allah knows best. He still may be referring to the previous one to be his preferred opinion, rahimahullah ta'ala. Naam. With respect to his sallallahu alayhi wa saying, alhamdulillah fills the scale, subhanallah wa alhamdulillah, both fill our fills, Whatever, whatever is between the heaven and the earth. The narrator had some doubt about the wording. So here, Rahimahullah Ta'ala is being in with number two and number three. When it says, come to saying, Alhamdulillah, Alhamdulillah, we call this Tahmeed. Tahmeed or Hamd. When it comes to saying, Subhanallah, we call this Tasbih. So there is Tasbih and there is Tahmeed. What's coming next right now, what's coming next right now, he is gonna bring other narrations in which he will add other phrases of praise that will have similar reward in terms of filling a scale, in terms of filling between the heavens and the earth. Of these two actually phrases, the phrase of takbir, which is saying what? Allahu Akbar, right? And the phrase of tahleel, and that's saying la ilaha illallah, which we call the kalima. So now he's gonna be speaking about these four words how do they, or these phrases actually, how do they fill the scale, how they make this reward actually possible? So he would say, he would talk about tasbih, tahmeed, takbir, and tahleel. Go ahead. In the version of an nasai and Ibn Majah, there is glorification, tasbih, and magnification, takbir, fill the heaven and the earth. So that's another narration now. It's actually about tasbih and takbir, not tasbih and tahmeed anymore. Yes, okay. In the hadith of the man from Bani Sulaim, there is the sbih, glorification is a half of the scales, and praise, alhamdulillah, fills it. Magnification, takbir, fills what is between the heaven and the earth. So basically now it's the, give a different meaning. So tasbih is half of the scale, takbir, I mean tahmeed, fills the full scale, and takbir is the one that fills between the heavens and the earth. So now a different meaning, or different actually interpretation or narration right now. So the multiple narrations gonna come up after that, including him adding at takbir wa tahmeed. So I want you to move to the where he speaks about at tahleel in the next page, Jafar al al Faryabi. Jafar al Faryabi narrated in his book Al Dhikr, and the others also narrated the hadith of Ali that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Alhamdulillah fills the scales, and Subhanallah is half of the scales, 
and la ilaha illallah and Allahu Akbar fill the heavens and the earth and what is in between them. So now he's not, not just Allahu Akbar fills between the heavens and the earth, he's adding in this narration Allahu Akbar and la ilaha illallah both combined fill between the heavens and the earth. So there are many, many narrations in regard to, to this. The conclusion about these four phrases he said, these, these had comprised. These hadith, uh, uh, these hadith comprise the virtue of these four phrases, which are the best of speech. And they are SubhanAllah, Glory be to Allah, Alhamdulillah, Praise belongs to Allah, La ilaha illallah, There is no God except Allah, and Allahu Akbar, Allah is greater. By the way, the, the ulama, yani, subhan, this is something called uh, yani, uh, uh, Jawab al-Hakim. Jawab al-Hakim is the, the answer of the sage or the answer of the wise man. Why? When someone asks you a question, you give them an answer and more than what they ask for based on what you know about my possible circumstance. Like the Prophet when he was asked, قَالُوا رَسُولَ اللَّهُ مِنْ مَاءِ الْبَحْرِ Ya Rasulullah, we travel on, by sea for a long time and sometimes we don't have fresh water, enough fresh water. Is it permissible to do tahara from the seawater? He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, It's permissible to make wudu from it and also eat the dead animal of the sea. They didn't ask about food, did they? But he gave them Jawab al-Hakim. He knew that this possibly could be a situation for them, so he gave them the answer before even he got there. Here Imam Ibn Rajab, rahimahullah ta'ala, he didn't just explain what was mentioned in the hadith, which is the tasbih and tahmeed. He knew based on the other narration, there is, listen, there might be confusing for some when they read the other hadith that says the exact same virtues for takbir and tahleel. So he said, let me combine all this together for you so you can see what do they mean exactly. And how he's going to explain them one at a time. Now. As for praise, alhamdulillah, all of the hadith agree that it fills the scales. Mm -hmm. Some say that it is struck, some say that it is struck as a metaphor, and that the meaning is that if praise were a physical body, it would fill the scales. Mm -hmm. Some say that on the contrary, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will represent the actions of the descendants of Adam and their words as forms which will be seen on the day of rising and which will be weighed. As the Prophet sallallahu said, the Qur'an will come on the day of rising preceded by Al-Baqarah and Al-Imran and as if there were two clouds or two shades or two flocks of birds in ranks. So what is he trying to say over here, Rahimahullah Ta'ala says, what does it mean to fill the scale? Is it physically will fill the scale or is it just a metaphor? So those, they said one example is it's just a metaphor. Like, yeah, it's not maybe in terms of physical weight because there is no physical um, being for the word SubhanAllah or Alhamdulillah in this situation here. So he said, it's just a metaphor. And other they say, no, 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 listen. Even your good deeds on the Day of Judgment, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will probably give, give them special forms. So they come in a form of a human being, just like what Surah Al-Baqarah and Al-Imran, or comes like clouds, come like in different you know, forms, and they will have an actual physical weight. So when it's put in the scale, it will weigh so heavily. So this is what he means by when he was speaking about Alhamdulillah, but what he really highlights over here ex exclusively said that all the other narrations that we spoke about so far, they all agree that Alhamdulillah fills the scales. By itself, it fills the scales. Why? He's going to bring that later, inshallah ta'ala. But for now, I just want you to be aware of that. He says all of the narrations agree that Alhamdulillah fills the scales. Naam. Let's move on to the next one. Amma subhanallah. As for subhanallah, glory, glory be to Allah, there is in the narration of Muslim, subhanallah and alhamdulillah, both fill or fills whatever is between the heaven and the earth. The narrator was in doubt as to what it, what it is that fills between heaven and earth, and whether it is praises or one of them. In the version of An-Nasai in Ibn Majah, it is glorification and magnification, tasbih wa takbir, fill heaven and earth. And this version is more suitable. There is a question as to whether what is meant is that both together fill what is between heaven and earth or each one independently fills that. So what does that mean over here? Does it mean that they're both now 50-50 fill the, the, the between the heaven and the earth or the scale or between the heavens and the earth or is it actually maybe 70-30? So yeah, it might not be 50-50, could be 70-30, but both combined will fill the scale between the heavens and the earth. Now, In the hadith of Abu Huraira and the other man, there is that there is that the takbir alone fills what is between heaven and the earth. In any case, tasbih stands in a lower rank with respect to virtue as it, clearly, as it is, as is clearly narrated in the hadith of Ali, Abu Huraira, Abdullah ibn Amr, and man from Bani Sulaim. The tasbih is half of the scales, walhamdulillah fills it. 
why? Before we read that, the reason why. I want to I wanna see, why do you think that tahmeed, saying alhamdulillah, is heavier than saying subhanallah? Huh? Because alhamd means what? Praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what? His perfection. And subhanallah is what? Freeing him from imperfections. Which one is more powerful? Is to praise him for perfection or to free him from imperfection? Let me get you as an example as a human being. If I want to describe, if I want to praise you, for example, I can say you're smart, you're intelligent, you're handsome, all these beautiful things. Or, which, or do you think that praising you like this by saying you're not stupid, you're not, you're not dumb, you're not ugly, I'm not saying anything bad about you, am I? So which one do you think actually has uh, um, any more value to you? Do you want people to say that you're not stupid, you're not, you're not, you know, you're not dumb, you're not ugly? I mean, they're praising you still, right? At least in that sense. But even though, even though, they are st still you know, kind of freeing him from imperfection, but it's not the same, the same way. It doesn't have the same way. But perfection is when you praise him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, with those qualities of perfection. So he's going to explain that why now. The reason for that is the praise is affirmation that all praises are for Allah, thus comprising affirmation of all the attributes of perfection and, majest and majesty, whereas tasbih is purification of Allah from all shortcomings, defects, and flaws. So affirmation is more complete and perfect than negation. I think it's obvious right now for us, what does that exactly mean? Now, and in order for the praise of saying subhanallah to be perfected, there is something has to come with it. So he says, It is for that reason that tasbih is not mentioned on its own, mm. but rather coupled with that which indicates affirmation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's perfection. Sometimes it is coupled with praise, as is the saying, Subhanallah wa bihamdi. Glory be to Allah by his praise. And Subhanallah, glory be to Allah, walhamdulillah, and praise belongs to Allah. And sometimes it is coupled with one of the names which indicate greatness and, and majesty, such as his words. Subhanallah al azim glory be to Allah the Great. So as you know, it's obvious right now. So when you say Subhanallah, you're most likely going to say Subhanallah with something else. Subhanallah, bihamdi, Subhanallah, Subhanallah, bihamdi, Subhanallah. But how many times you say Alhamdulillah without saying anything else with that? That's that's why when you say Alhamdulillah, don't say I cannot complain. You couple that with that statement, it probably negates the meaning of saying Alhamdulillah. Be careful with that. Now, let's move on to the next to the next one, at takbir. As for takbir, in the hadith of Abu Huraira in the man from Bani Sulaim, there is that it alone fills what is between the heavens and the earth. In the hadith of Ali radiallahu anhu, there, the, there is that takbir along with la ilaha illallah, there is no God except Allah, fills the heavens and the earth and what is between them. Naam. So here we can see that it's, it's alone fills between the heavens and the earth, takbir. Naam. As for tahleel, la ilaha illallah, there is no God except Allah, Alone, it reaches Allah without any barrier between it and Him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. At-Tirmidhi narrated a hadith of Abu Huraira radiallahu anh, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, if a slave says, la ilaha illallah, there is no God except Allah, sincerely, the gates of heaven will be opened for him until it reaches the throne, as long as he awaits major wrong actions. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ya rabbil alameen. So here's a speaker about the virtue and the value of saying, la ilaha illallah. And there is so much to show you how, how uh, uh, valuable, uh, how heavy La ilaha illallah is, it's coming in hadith qala Abu Mama. Abu Mama radiallahu anh said, any slave who repeats La ilaha illallah, then nothing short of the throne holds it back. It has also been narrated that, the nothing, that nothing equals it, it in weight, in the scales, in the famous hadith of the scrap of paper. What does that, which hadith is that? He refers to the hadith, uh, when the Prophet ﷺ said, قال, ليس, ليس, uh, um, a man actually, um, he had uh, uh, one, one hasana left for him to enter Jannah. He's lacking one single merit. So he was told, go and find someone. If someone can give you one merit, then you go to Jannah. And this guy now frantically going all over that day of judgment, that, that location, uh, that gathering place, Al-Hashr, asking his family, his friend, his loved, his parents, they would say, Ilayka anni, nafsi, nafsi. I don't, I don't even recognize you. I don't even know who you are. <laughs> He's, I'm not going to give you anything. So he kept going to different people that he loved, he knew in dunya, and no one's given him anything. And finally, he came to a guy who had nothing in his good scale or his good record except for one single scrap of paper that says, La ilaha illallah. 
Al-Bitaqa means actually a card, like a scrap of paper. Hadith al-Bitaqa. So he came, to, it's known as Hadith al-Bitaqa, that's what it's called in Arabic, Hadith al-Bitaqa. So uh, the man, he says, uh, he said, what about this one? Can I get, he said, well, I mean, it doesn't, I don't know, you can take it and see if it helps you with anything. For subhanAllah, I mean, this person, obviously, that hasana would actually would be sufficient for this individual. There's another hadith al bitaqa actually, as a matter of fact, I have to correct that. Hadith al bitaqa is the man who had so many bad deeds and he had only one single card that says, La ilaha illallah for his hasanat. Just a single one. And when it was put in that scale, tashat bihinna as safha, all his bad deeds were just, you know, kind of uh, disappeared and start flying because of the heavy weight of la ilaha illallah. If it was done properly and sincerely, definitely, it is absolutely the heaviest in the scale. So that's why he referred this to say, it is actually also considered very heavy in the scale. So which one is heavier then? Is it subhanallah, is it alhamdulillah? Is it subhanallah? Is it subhanallah, alhamdulillah combined versus la ilaha illallah? There are different actual reasons or actually in terms of what is considered the heaviest. So let's move on to the next point where he says there are different views. There are different views as to which of the two phrases is better. The phrase of praise or the phrase of la ilaha illallah. Ibn Abd al-Barq and, other, and others narrated this divergence. As al nakhai said, they used to think that hamd is speech whose reward is most multiplied. A thawri said, nothing of the speech is multiplied in reward as much as alhamdulillah. Alhamd comprises affirmation of all types of Allah's perfection. So the tawheed is included in it. Because we're talking about perfection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the greatest perfection of Allah is what? His oneness. So it's included already when you say alhamdulillah. Naam. There is in the musnad of, musnad, uh, there is in the musnad of Imam Ahmed from Abu Sa'id and Abu Huraira that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Allah singled four things out from speech. Subhanallah, walhamdulillah, la ilaha illallah, wallahu akbar. Whoever says subhanallah will have 20 good deeds recorded for him, or 20 wrong actions will be removed from his record. Whoever says Allahu Akbar has, like, has the like of that. Whoever says la ilaha illallah has the like of that. And whoever says alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, praise belong to Allah, the Lord of the worlds, from himself will have 30 good deeds recorded for him, or 30 wrong actions removed from his record. This also has been narrated from uh, narrated of Ka'ad as his own words, and some say that this is more authentic than ascribing it to the Prophet It's not necessarily authentic to be attributed to the Prophet rather it's the statement of the Ka'ab, Ka'ab himself, uh, Rahim, Rahim Allah, so this is now we know from, um, from all of this right now. Regardless how you want to view them, which one is heavier, all of them, the four phrases, which are Subhanallah, Alhamdulillah, Wa La Ilaha Illallah, Wallahu Akbar, they're very powerful, very powerful statement. Out of them, which are the two most powerful statements and phrases, Jama'a? Alhamdulillah and La ilaha illallah. Alhamdulillah and La ilaha illallah. Now, the debate among the ulama, which one is heavier? Is it Alhamdulillah or La ilaha illallah? Those who say Alhamdulillah, because they believe, since Alhamdulillah is all about attributing and affirming perfection to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the greatest, of course, affirmations is His oneness, and it's part of saying Alhamdulillah. So, La ilaha illallah is included in Alhamdulillah. And others say, no, La ilaha illallah is heavier because it's proven in the hadith that when the man put all his deeds in one side and La ilaha illallah simply was there, it was actually heavier than everything else. Now, that doesn't mean that he did not say Alhamdulillah because maybe he did, Allahu Alam, but was negated with other bad deeds, unfortunately. But overall, it's a debate among the ulama, so you can, inshallah ta'ala, choose whichever opinion based on what you've understood from the statement of Rajab rahmatullahi ta'ala alayhi. I personally kind of like feeling more comfortable to say La ilaha illallah is stronger. Why? Because the Prophet said, Qala afdal al dhikr, La ilaha illallah. The best of all words of dhikr is to say La ilaha illallah. If it was Alhamdulillah, the Prophet probably would have actually attributed that to Alhamdulillah, not to La ilaha illallah. Wallahu ta'ala. We'll stop here, inshallah ta'ala. Next week we'll continue with the hadith, bi idnillahi azza wa jal. Let's see the question, inshallah. Okay, we have, we have questions already actually been posted, so we're going to go over the questions, inshallah, um, uh, The question is, I feel uh, um, I'm only increasing my religious level for an ex-person, not for Allah, How can I fight this? 
Lie, look, sincerity is an ongoing battle until you meet your Lord, until you die. So you're going to always try to fight that, the, the feeling. As long, as long as you do it right, inshallah azza wa jal, and you're not showing off to that individual. Rather, you want to improve your iman to be like that person, hopefully to match with them. That intention is okay. That intention is okay, to match with this individual's level of iman. But if you would like to increase your iman so that they can, you know, realize, oh, he, she is, mashallah, being uh, uh, great, or he's being, mashallah, great, he's doing great deeds, and so on, then that's, that's riya, and that deed is nullified. So you need to fight those feelings and hopefully to focus, inshallah ta'ala, on, on the good one, which means I am increasing my iman, so hopefully I can match him, I can match her, so hopefully we become maybe attracted to each other, you know, for marriage. Now, what does it mean to have uh, husn al-khuluq with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Ah, subhanAllah, when ulama, they speak about husn al-khuluq, it's also different levels, right? Husn al-khuluq ma'Allah, first and foremost. Like if you want to have husn al-khuluq, you're not going to just focus on husn al-khuluq, good, good manners, good character with your friends and your parents and your children. These are different categories. But husn al-khuluq ma'Allah is the highest. And if you have husn al-khuluq ma'Allah, what does that mean exactly? He's the priority. So when you pray, how do you pray? In three seconds, right? Or you pray with khushu'. That's husn al-khuluq ma'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You pray with khushu'. When you fast, what's husn al-khuluq ma'Allah azza wa jal? You fast and you observe the proper etiquette for fasting. Violating that, unfortunately, that's sul adab, ma'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you give charity, how do you do that? You give it with ihsan, for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, without taunting people with that charity. But keep bragging about it and talking about it, that's sul adab, ma'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When you make dua, you make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with confidence that he will answer you. Instead of saying, my Lord, I've been asking what's going on here. That's sul adab, ma'Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, husn al-khuluq, Opposite to that, su'ul adab, which means bad manners. Now, how can we determine husn al khuluq, especially when the reality of things are many times behind closed doors? That is absolutely true. Here's the thing: at the end of the day, at the end of the day, um, you're not going to know the real person until what you live with them. So you're going to have to take risks, and life is all about really taking risks. So there's no escape of taking risks when it comes to choosing something for marriage. Your job is to do all what you can, your best in, in, in trying to investigate by doing istishara first, meaning asking families, asking friends, see their, you know, their social media profiles, if they have any. All these things can give you indicators about their akhlaq and their manners. And see them you know, around other people. How do they behave with the elders? How do they behave with their friends? How do they behave with their family? Uh, what's the perception of that? Ask a certain question about, for example, how do they react in certain scenarios? During, for example, anger. Are they angry people? Are they very tolerant? Would they do this or do that? So by looking around and asking people and get answers and see for yourself, observe for yourself, hopefully you'll be able, inshallah, to determine if the person has that husn al-khuluq you're looking for or otherwise. And again, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, no matter how good the person is, once you get married, you will see a different person, different reality. And even good people, even good people, good, well-mannered people, subhanAllah, after marriage, you never know. They might flip. Not because of you, because of certain circumstances in their lives. May Allah make it easy for them, Ya Rabbil Alameen. And some people you might marry, and they're not the best akhlaq and manners, and subhanAllah, living with you, you might transform their lives for them. And they become good people. So you have to have, and have that faith and have, take some risk, and of course, do your best. Are you going to be misjudging people? Possibly. And I have seen a lot of these examples, where sisters, they come to me and they say, well, they said he's, mashallah, musalli, he's ibadah, this and that. And so he barely actually wake up for fajr. And he barely, you know, uh, does this. He barely does that. I said, well, Allah, may Allah make it easy for you. I mean, honestly, if you can help, inshallah, to improve his iman, his deen, that would be great. Does she have to stay with him? That's up to her. But if you can work together, inshallah, to make things better for yourselves, alhamdulillah, rabbi alamin. If the arf keeps getting higher and higher, how can we be reasonable? Yeah, Allah understand. Then, then go to, to the family who's closest to your uh, standards and situation. Because in some cultures, for example, when you get married, you don't just give a mahar to the girl. You give the mahar to the father and the mother and the, and the siblings and everybody else, and probably even the mayor even. The, the whole, everybody takes a share in your marriage, basically. 
So therefore, it's, it's, it's difficult. It's not really right, wallahi. And unfortunately, the people who do so, they have reasons for that. Sometimes it's financial reason. Why? I mean, we would like to get, get wealthy, so they want to get the mahar, and so they can buy a house or build this or make that, all these kind of things. Sometimes they raise their mahar because they want to make this as, an, as a, a safety net for their daughters. Just like in, in case it doesn't work out, alhamdulillah, at least she will land on something hefty. That's if, if he is honorable enough to give her that mahar if they divorce. Because unfortunately, the experience that I know from people, even if the mahar was high, as a mu'akhar, which is deferred mahar, if they, if they live on bad terms, he's not going to give her a penny. Matter of fact, he's going to make her life difficult so she can ask for khulr. So instead of, instead of him paying her mahar, she's going to pay him back the money he gave. So it doesn't really guarantee what you're looking for in the relationship here. And the third reason why people, they, give, they ask for high mahar is because, unfortunately, they equate the mahar with their social status. They equate the mahar with their social status. What does that mean? They know in certain families that, wallahi, mashallah, the daughter of fulan and fulan, she was given in marriage for a million dollars or half a million dollars. But if you give them for a few thousand dollars, what do they say? Why? What's wrong? What's wrong with her? What's the problem with that? So, astaghfirullah, these are all, unfortunately, bad habits and bad cultures. They're not appropriate cultures you know, in the deen. But the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is to make things easy, inshallah. Was Sa'id ibn Musayyab the son-in-law of Abu Huraira? Naam, he was. Radiallahu ta'ala wa rada. What can our masajid and social interaction venues do to um, uh, inculcate culture of, guard, of, of guarding the, the gaze of men observing hijab for women so that the standard for beauty, what is pleasing to the eye, is not so high? I mean, subhanAllah, even if it's not in the masajid, it's already out there. Men, women, they don't really pay, base their, uh, their yani, standard of beauty based on what they see in the masajid. They, have, they are bombarded by this on TV, on social media, uh, on the internet, everywhere you go. Even when you walk, you have all these big billboards sometimes posting all these unique you know, pictures and so forth. So unfortunately, the bombardment is all over the place. So it's not really about the measure otherwise. But definitely, definitely, it's our moral responsibility as men and women being in a community, alhamdulillah, I mean, to watch our guards and guard our, actually, our, our gaze yani, so that we are respectful to one another. And remember, like I said, when it comes to beauty, is the eye of the beholder. You need also to educate yourself about the meaning of beauty. Don't be like everybody else in the superficial level of beauty. It's way beyond the physical image of lying. Which rawi is the one who doubted the tamla or tamla'an? Um, that actually is so, someone in the sub the narrators of the, of the hadith, which was not mentioned in the book here. I didn't actually look into it, so Allahu alam. Is there a guide for women looking for spouse? Do the four qualities mentioned for the women applies to looking for a husband too? Actually, the Prophet ﷺ for women, what did he say? He said, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهُ فَزَوُّجُهُ if, if a man comes to you and you're pleased with his deen and akhlaq, meaning his relationship with Allah and the relationship with the, with the people, then don't reject this man. Accept him. Did he mention anything about his wealth? As long as he's a skillful person who's going to earn money, alhamdulillah, then we're good. Did he mention anything about his, how handsome he is, his beauty? And all guys believe they're beautiful, right? Right? So it's not necessarily the, the most important things for women, actually. And, if, and, and reality tells us about this. You've seen, unfortunately, in some popular culture, is that a woman is willing to marry somebody who's 70 years old when she's 20 years old. Why is that? Because of his money. So it's, it's not the stand that it's, it's not what they're really looking for, is being handsome or, or being this or being that. So that's why the Prophet ﷺ, he actually says, focus on these two things about men. This is the most important thing for you. Their deen and their akhlaq. Wallahu alam. But does it mean a woman shouldn't look for a husband who's handsome, yani? No. But what does it mean to be handsome? Something pleasing to the eye. That's it. The deen, akhlaq, al-hasab, and the mahar, 
Is that listed in order of priority? It's an argument among the muhadithin. They were listed in order of priority. But um, yeah, and it's, it's not conclusive in that regard. So now, not necessarily. What is reasonable in terms of looking at future spouse? Are you allowed to remove your hijab? No. I don't recommend for you to remove your hijab in front of a guy who wants to see you without hijab. If he has ladies who can let him know, alhamdulillah, he can see, for example, uh, the, the overall in the family from the kids, for example, how they look like and all their hair and so on. They can tell that. Why this is actually not, is not a good idea. What if his mashallah is satisfied with you 100%? He was pleased, he's happy, he came two, three times, and then the only thing that's a, a deal breaker for him is what? He wants to see you without your hijab. And then you do that. You go and you beautify yourself and you make your hair, mashallah, look fancy and beautiful and so on. And the next day he calls, he goes, oh, I'm so sorry. How devastating that is for the lady. How horrible that could be for her, subhanAllah. It breaks her, uh, and her self-esteem completely. That's why if the man needs to man up and listen, look, you're going to have to also, like we said, always there's always an element of taking risk. Wallahu alam, na'am. So um, why do we make the distinction between religiosity and good character? Aren't they two sides of the same coin? Of course, obviously, there's no doubt about it. But just this is from an academic point of view to separate between the two things. It's because people confuse these things. They think that someone is mashallah because of their long beard and fluffy hijab, they must be mashallah perfect in their akhlaq and their character. No, your length of the, the beard and the fluffy hijab doesn't, doesn't guarantee you're a good person. It's simply you just have some religiosity. Spirituality is a different thing. You know, there are very specific you know, questions about marriage and mahar and all these things, and we're going to have to skip them, inshallah ta'ala. Wallahu ta'ala. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashraan wa sallam wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Oh, by the way, uh, someone's asking, could you please mention what books are used for these sessions? Are they listed somewhere? Can someone make a, uh, answer that comment there, inshallah, we'll give them the books now, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. And even sh share the link with them, inshallah. Jazakumullah khair. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashraan wa sallam wa barakatuh. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Yes, sir. Uh, I want to say thank you for your Allah is very good. Only what you do here, Allah is you take it all my time. So Allah is very good. Imagine how you do it. Allah is very good. Allah is very good. Allah is very good.